All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our Exploring the Deep Sea Corals webinar. My name is Rachel Hawes, and I am the Land, Water, and Wildlife Project Manager here at the Coastal Conservation League, located in Charleston, South Carolina, with a couple of other offices um, sprinkled around the state. Uh, most of my work, though, is focusing around oysters, salt marsh, and fisheries-related projects. So with that, we also have, doc, we have Dr. Leslie Sauter, a marine geologist, researcher, and professor with the College of Charleston. I reached out to Dr. Sauter a couple of months ago about being a presenter for our internal brown bag lunch series, which is where we have presentations um, from various people during our lunch hour for staff. Um, of course, we had to do it virtually, but even virtually, our staff loved her presentation so much that we decided to host one uh, for you all. It's really that cool. Um, I think you guys will like it as well. Dr. Sauter currently teaches marine geology, seafloor mapping, and seafloor research classes to undergraduate students at the College of Charleston, where they get to engage in actual research and gain at sea field experience. Um, just yesterday, she said she'd had about 10 to 12 students get to go on the research exploration trips themselves over the last few years, um, which I think is really awesome to get that hands-on experience. She founded Project Oceanica at the College of Charleston in 2001 and directs the college's seafloor mapping program, BEAMS. Dr. Sauter has been on some amazing research trips and expeditions, including the one we are going to hear about today, where she is, was a co-lead scientist on a NOAA 2018 deep sea coral discovery expedition. Before we get started, I just have a couple of things to run through um, before we start. So the presentation will last about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will also have a question and answer session afterwards. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box. That box is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You are going to be muted and you will remain muted throughout the presentation. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out in a follow-up email to all of the registered participants. All right, I will pass this over to Leslie and we will get started. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for inviting me to do these. I've really enjoyed uh, speaking to people who find an interest in deep sea corals. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, where do I share my screen? There we go. <laughs> and start the presentation. Everyone see it? Yes. Okay, all good. Great. Well, I want to talk to you about a wonderful expedition that I was fortunate to take part in um, in 2018 with NOAA to explore our seaward backyard, very close to shore. Uh, well, not, not very close to shore, but close to our region of the continental margin. We used the NOAA ship Oceanus Explorer, 250 foot exploration vessel in the NOAA fleet. And this is overseen by NOAA Ocean Exploration and Research, or OER. And you'll hear a lot about OER in the coming slides. So how this works is we begin these expeditions by acquiring much better maps than what currently existed. Um, if you look at Google Earth today, you'll see that the seafloor has been mapped. Yes, it has been, but it's been mapped in low resolution. It's a, it's a blurry focus. You can think of it that way. We have only about 5% of the seafloor mapped in high resolution, as though you're wearing your prescription glasses. And that's not good enough. We've missed so much of what lies below. So more recently, in the last decade, we've been using multi-beam sonar. And multi-beam sonar is like uh, fish finders and depth recorders but it's a lot of energy being emitted from a vessel in a swath of, of data being collected. And we mow the lawn, we go back and forth in the vessel and collect a tremendous amount of data about depths of the seafloor. And so we're using sound to map the seabed based on how 
quickly sound bounces uh, off the seabed and knowing the velocity of sound in seawater. So we end up with these incredible maps that we can render in three dimensions and gain so much more information from these maps along with just the depth. So that's the first step. We have to have good maps so we can choose locations where we want to explore specifically because we can't explore the whole seafloor for sure. So we use these um, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs from the NOAA ship Oceanus Explorer. And an ROV is tethered to the vessel so that the vessel is unmanned but can be operated from the ship. And so the power is supplied uh, with a cable and the video can come back and we can see the live video as the, as the ROV is moving across the seabed. And those are the great video that you're gonna see in this presentation. So there are two of these vehicles on board. The smaller one is Sirius and it hovers above the larger workhorse, um, Deep Discover, or affectionately known as D2. And the way that we do this is, we, what we call it is ground truth, because we can't see the seabed. And even when we map, that's a remotely sensed depth. We don't know what's actually down there. So we need to send these vehicles down to image the seafloor. And we use high definition video. There's a video camera here, and there's a still camera here as well. So we get lots, that's the primary data being collected is the imagery. There are also uh, ways to sample uh, different objects or clip the very tips of some corals, things like that. There's a manipulator arm. Again, all of this is controlled from the ship, which can be, you know, thousands of meters above where the vessel is. And we can put those samples in open boxes here or in bins that slide under our, and are protected so we don't lose them on the way up. Just to give you a sense of scale, this is a very large vehicle. I'm five feet, eight inches. And so it's quite a piece of machinery and a very effective tool to visualize the seafloor. NOAA has invested a tremendous amount of time to perfect their way of engaging the world. If you want to tune into any of these live demonstrations or live explorations, I should say, you can log in and see what we see in real time. You can see us map the seafloor, which would occur on a separate cruise from the cruises where we visit the seabed using these ROVs. But all of this is done in telepresence and at any one time we have a thousand or more people watching. It's really great. So the ship uh, holds about 50 people, half of which are the people running the ship, the NOAA officers and the crew. There are only three scientists on board this vessel at any one of the ROV expeditions. And there's always a geology lead, which was me on this particular cruise. My co-lead, Cheryl Morrison, who's a biology lead and a coral expert and then Stephanie Bush, who is from the Smithsonian, who managed the sampling. And here are the three Mouseketeers. We also always have a coordinator for NOAA, for OER, who runs everything from ship to shore work uh, uh, to the daily activities and before the cruise and after cruise, and Casey was our lead. There's also a lead mapping person. The bulk of the mapping is done on the previous cruise but on our cruise, we still map in between sites. We take advantage of every moment being out at sea and Derek was our lead mapper. So in addition to the three of us um, and the uh, expedition team from NOAA and the ship's officers, there are other people who make this uh, the amazing experience that it is for the public. And those are the people who are the videography team and of course the still imagery as well. And they work almost around the clock, taking the video that we collect, making highlight video and sending it back to shore so the next day these things can be posted on the website. And then finally, some of the, well, certainly in my opinion, the most important people on board, other than the cook, is um, the group of the ROV folks. And they are the ones who make this operation work very, very efficiently. 
So there are 50 of us on board. We can't possibly know everything we see. So that live communication and broadcast allows um, chat room scientists to participate. And in one expedition, we had more than 200 scientists from around the globe contributing their knowledge to us, typing in their responses of what they see, helping us to identify things, giving them giving their knowledge to us. And it's, it's an amazing collaboration and they were from all over the globe. So on any one dive, which might last from six to eight hours, depending on the water depth, um, we will deploy each of these vehicles. And Sirius again hovers above the D2 and here you can see the cable connecting the power and also allowing for the feedback of the live stream video. And then from the mission control, the very cold room that we have to sit in for eight hours, um, we are captivated by what D2 sees on the seafloor. And so the front row here, let me introduce you to the navigators. This is the lead navigator for, or he's the pilot for D2, and you can see the screen in front of him of the high resolution video. To his right is the person who manages the Sirios, and here you can see the view of D2 from the hovering uh, Sirios above it. And then on the left is the navigator who coordinates where the ROVs are with respect to where the ship is. On the far right is the lead videographer and that person controls the zoom factor, the lighting, the color, everything to give us the best image quality possible. In the back row, we have the three scientists um, uh, or the two scientists actually, that myself and Cheryl. And then you can see our chat room scientists are contributing on their regular live stream as well. On the right here is the videographer who is constantly taking clips as we see them to start building those highlight clips that we can make into the web resources. So I'm gonna show you why we do this. And this is leaving from Charleston. Given the proximity of so many millions of people that live along the southeast coast, it seems that, of course, this area would be very well known and we would know exactly where everything is. And that's so not true. Every dive that we've done has been in places where people have not been before. And so all of this information is really important to managing our deep sea resources. This large area was deemed a coral habitat area of particular concern by the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council in 2010. Well, I cut that video short, but the full length three minute video is on the website and I'll provide that link at the end. So let me introduce you to our continental margin. The continental margin is basically the rock of the continent, but it happens to be submerged. And so we don't see it and we don't know it very well. We have the extension of our land that is called the continental shelf and that goes out to about a depth of 200 meters. If you go offshore at North Carolina, it drops off fairly rapidly into the deep sea. And this is uh, the region in the north is a lot more traditional or typical of a continental margin. But our region is very different. Instead of dropping off to five kilometers water depth, it drops off at the edge of the continental shelf to about 500 meters, something like that. And then it is a broad, relatively flat, gently sloping region known as the Blake Plateau. And at about a thousand meters water depth, it begins to descend quite rapidly into depths here of about five kilometers. So almost a four kilometer drop. And this is called the Blake Escarpment. And farther north, where I'm gonna show you a dive from along here, it drops off not quite as deep, but it's still a, a fairly steep incline. So this region here, the Blake Plateau, is where we are finding so many deep coral habitats. This region is also highly influenced, as you probably know, by the Gulf Stream, which brings us that 
warm, muggy air that bathes our region. And it also brings very warm water, of course, along the edge of our continental shelf. And this impacts even at depth, but not so much warming the bottom waters as it is providing a current and providing food. And deep sea corals, they need food. Anything living on the seafloor needs access to food. So having that current provide new food all the time is very important for long-term survival. So to explore this region, we need good maps. I've said that just a few times. I'm a little biased towards the mapping side. And this image here shows in the light blue what you would see on Google Earth today. The black areas are the only areas that we had mapped prior to 2018 in high resolution. And this broad region had already shown us that there was great potential for deep sea coral habitats. And many of those regions had been uh, visited using remotely operated vehicles or submersibles. NOAA said, we need to do a lot more. And so on the expedition prior to mine, they did all of these areas. It takes about two weeks to do all of this. And then we dove on several of those areas. NOAA has returned to this area several times and convinced others to help us out with the mapping. And so now, just since that previous expedition, much more of the seafloor has been mapped. And it's really exciting to me because we are seeing things we had no idea were down there. Um, I want to give a shout out to my son, Will Sauter. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. He is a uh, lead mapper for one of the NOAA offices and he compiled this for me. And I asked him to color code it um, from 200 meters to 1500 meters so you can really see the detail. I'm going to show you a close up. This is what the seafloor looks like if you zoom into our region on say Google Earth or GeoMap app. It doesn't look like very much, not too exciting, but that's the low resolution version. Now we have a window into the deep and see all of this detail. We see these long gullies off Jacksonville under the Gulf Stream. I'll show you details and close up of this whole region. We see cliffs and canyons, um, just so much more than we knew existed. Well offshore, we don't see nearly as much. So we had to verify that as well. So now you see the importance of mapping. From those early expeditions where this region was mapped, that spawned a lot of interest. And so since 1987, many different expeditions from NOAA and other groups have explored little pinpoints of the area using submersibles and ROVs. And every blue dot here is where an expedition saw deep sea coral. In that little video clip I showed you, the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council has um, designated this area outlined in red here. And that is the deep coral habitat area of particular concern. There are a lot of acronyms, the HAPC. And so that was at the time a uh, known area for deep sea coral. You see there are plenty of blue dots outside of that area because of the new mapping, the new explorations, we're finding more and more deep coral well beyond the main axis of the Gulf Stream. So we're very interested. And there are also areas along the northern region that have been protected. So there's a lot of interest in do we need to expand these habitat areas of particular concern. The exploration focus is to identify deep sea habitats, in particular looking for deep sea coral habitats and also looking for deep sea sponges that we know even less about in terms of what species occur where. The nice thing is they typically occur together, or at least where we find one, we often find another. There are certainly regions where one may exist and the other doesn't. Um, but when we find deep sea coral, we also find many other organisms coexisting. So it's not just a coral habitat, it's a highly diverse in terms of the numbers of species of different organisms all living together. So we have to understand these habitats and decide if we need to protect them. 
we also are seeing this part of the world for the first time. So of course, we're likely to see new species. We can't always collect one to actually identify it, but a lot of times we think we see new species. We are also seeing species we know in places we didn't know they existed. That's called an expanded range. But the other key thing is we're seeing them in their habitat. Instead of getting a sample from the seafloor and we don't know where it lived or who it lived with. So um, this is really powerful to see predator prey relationships, who's eating whom, obviously, and who lives happily, mutualistically together. So it's been really educational for everybody. These expeditions also tend to look at gas seep areas, methane gas seeps and submarine canyons and shipwrecks. I'm not gonna be talking about those today, but those are also included on the web resources on the website. So just a quick uh, tutorial about deep sea corals. Most of you are familiar with shallow water corals. They, shallow watery corals require warm water. They require clear water because they have algal symbionts living within the polyps, the actual living organism of a coral community. And those algal symbionts need light so you need shallow waters that are clear so that light can come in and allow the algal symbionts to survive. That is a symbiotic relationship that many shallow, most shallow water corals require. You've heard of coral bleaching. If the algal symbionts, which provide the color in shallow water corals, if they vacate the premises because the conditions aren't right, the coral becomes white. That is the color of the exoskeleton of the reef building shallow corals. It's calcium carbonate, which is white. And so we call that coral bleaching. So that's the shallow water scenario. Shallow, warm, clear waters. Deep corals, certainly it's not warm and certainly it's not light filled. It is dark. So they can't have the algal symbionts. They don't need them they have a different habitat and, and needs. They are suspension feeders. They, with their tentacles and the polyps, they grab any food particles that are available and bring them into their mouth or their open gut, basically. And so they require currents. They don't care so much about the temperature, and, but they do require currents and they require something to hold on to because of that current. They can't just roll around. So typically, well, always, they need something hard to attach to. And many deep sea corals attach to rocky surfaces. That's where the geology comes in, of course. The substrate is required to be hard so that the corals can attach to it. But not always can they find a rock, so sometimes they attach to other things, and that's what I'll be showing you. So these are some of the deep sea coral groups. Many different species have been encountered on these dives. Most of these are um, sort of soft corals. They don't have those stony exoskeletons that you see in the shallow water corals, but the shallow water corals, the reef building corals do have a deep water counterpart, the stony corals, and these are the ones that we're going to focus on. You'll see others as well, but I'll reintroduce you to those in a few slides. So let's look at where we went. We had 17 dives total in the three-week period. Some of the dives were north of this image, and I'm only going to show you some of those today. We're going to start with three dives that were on that eastern edge of the Blake Plateau. Remember, this is the Blake Escarpment area. And so this is in the area that is beginning to get quite deep. So water depths of, you know, between 800 to 1300 meters. The previous crews had just mapped all this new area. And so we picked three sites in this uh, suite of new maps. And here is if we took a knife and cut down through the whole margin. Charleston might be here. There's that shallow to 200 meters water depth continental shelf. That first little drop off and then the broad gently sloping Blake Plateau and then the steeper Blake Escarpment and then farther out. We dove in this area and we call these intraslope terraces because if you zoom into this area, 
This is a schematic of why we have these stair step like terraces. It's because the underlying surface are layers of rock that have solidified from sediments being deposited. They become lithified. We call that lithification. They become rock and then either faulting or erosion, uh, you know, erodes the edges and you get this stair step terrace like scenario. So a dive always begins at the base of the structure so that we can move up the structure and see it in front of us all the time. And this is not to scale. So when we begin a dive, we have to pick the site. So these are three sites that we had just mapped and we schedule the dive to go up and we have already chosen these sites because we think there are rocky exposures using other technology I'm not gonna talk about. I'm gonna show you video from this particular dive. So we're in the range of about 1300 meters water depth. When the um, D2 first lands, it's usually not on a rocky area. It's at the base of these rocky features. So of course you see here and there individual organisms, but you don't see big communities of different organisms. So these are just a few of the individuals that we saw at the base of this scarp. As a geologist, of course, I'm looking at what the substrate is, what the sea floor, sea bed feature is, and this is just a sandy bottomed area. There are a few organisms that can attach, they, can, they might be attached to something hard just below the surface here. But we begin to move up the slope onto this terrace and you see the rocks become exposed. You can see the layers of the rocks and immediately you see everything, every organism is taking advantage of rock exposure to cling to that rock in the current. This is a bubblegum coral. It's about a thousand years old, we would estimate from its size. It's almost six feet tall. And of course we collect rock samples, have to put that in. But these corals are very abundant in areas. Here is the top of that intraslope terrace. Every coral here is, is I think it's almost every coral is a different species here. So high diversity just among the corals. This is a glass sponge. We see the sponges coexisting and there are all sorts of other organisms, large and small, even the fish live under here, um, taking advantage of these habitats. This is a beautiful bamboo octocoral, uh, candelabra style morphology. And we, um, you know, it's probably a thousand years old. These are very slow growing large organisms. That's at least four feet tall and, and four feet wide. I'm not sure of the actual dimensions of that particular one. You can see that we do have a means to measure these little red dots here. That's our laser beams and they're 10 centimeters apart. That always gives us a scale because we're zooming in and out all the time. So that gives you a sense of what several areas within this Blake escarpment look like. They're rocky outcrops that um, these communities are taking advantage of to hold on. And there is current there providing them with food, but it's certainly not the Gulf Stream. There are other deep water currents that are impacting those seafloor areas. We're gonna move now to a very different kind of setting of deep sea corals. These are bioherms or mounds. A bioherm is a feature, in our case, a, a mounded feature that is built by organisms, by the remains of organisms. And we will be visiting four sites. So first of all, let's look at what these mound structures uh, are made of, basically. I mentioned stony corals. The shallow water corals, the reef building corals that you're more familiar with have that calcium carbonate exoskeleton. They are stony corals. The deep sea corals, not including this octocoral, but these corals are stony corals. This is the particular coral that we see as a deep sea coral reef builder um, in our region. There, is a, there are a couple other species of stony coral, but this is the primary one that we see in abundance. This is Lophilia pertusa. So Lophilia is bright white when it's healthy and alive. And remember I said they don't have apples symbionts to colorize them anyway. So what we are seeing is a healthy stony coral. 
um, the Madripoora is actually living on top of, oh, let me show you a close up first. This is the stony coral exoskeleton, the bright white, and these are the polyps. This is the, each of these is an individual organism. It's like an upside down jellyfish. That's what a living coral is, and we call it a polyp with the tentacles, and it's just open mouth and gut. Very simple organisms, but they colonize in these fantastic communities. So this Madripoora octocoral is living on top of a pile of dead stony coral. So Pertusa, when it dies, still is extremely important to the community because it becomes the hard substrate. There's no rock here. And so what are you gonna to attach to if you're a coral and wanna take advantage of the food there? Well, you grow on something that is a, a, a replacement of rock. You, you uh, grow on dead stony coral rubble. And not only do Madripoora, but many other organisms attach to this dead rubble, the exoskeleton remains. And over time, things build upward because the best place to capture food is higher up into the water column. That's where the current is strongest and that's where the food's gonna be. So organisms tend to build on top and upward and Lophilia pertusa does the same thing. It builds on top of its, you know, rubble its cousins from the past. And so these are slow growing. They die, they continue to grow. These mounds have built upward for hundreds to thousands of years. They are very major structures and they are very long lived structures or long dead structures. Um, so that's what a coral mound is and we call it a skeletal framework or coral rubble structure. So this high resolution map, this one was actually from 2013. You can see there are lots of little mounds here and some of them are in strings, some of them are along cliff-like areas. And so many of these had been individually explored. Those were the dots I showed you in that previous map, but we wanted to see more because our hypothesis was that most of these are coral habitats. The Gulf Stream, remember, is screaming along this area, making it difficult to dive. Um, from the surface, you have to have safe conditions, but we were able to dive down onto some of this. This is affectionately known as Million Mounds or Stetson Mesa, but it is the western part of the Blake Plateau. So to pick our dive site, we used our multi-beam uh, map imagery and we picked a site that started at the base and went up to the top of this one mound that was 100 meters tall. That's almost the size of a football field. So these are very significant structures. And basically all of this is the result of piling upward of Lophilia pertusa and its cousins. So here is some of the video. This is the second site that we looked at shown in the dots here. You see, we don't cover much area on one dive. And this particular dive, the second one, was over three humps, three different mounds that were interconnected. And at the tops of both of these mounds from the two dives were all these bright white communities of living Lophilia pertusa. And you see that is a large colony. And if you look in close, you see they're individual colonies within the larger picture of dead corals. There again is the living coral, but you see there are, um, these are different sponges, they're echinoderms. You see all the brown fuzzy coral here, coral rubble. There are sea stars and their cousins, we're collecting an unknown sponge here. This is a glass sponge. We always found these crabs associated different types of arthropods, including the golden crab. This is a very large meaty crab of great interest to fisheries, but you can see where it lives. If we were to trawl for a golden crab, a lot of habitat would be impacted. 
just beautiful imagery collected. And you can see the octocoral structure there. Lots of brittle stars. We encountered this strange black blob. Nobody knew at first what it was. You zoom in. We took a little sample of it because we weren't sure. None of the chat room scientists had seen it before. Turned out to be an encrusting sponge. But here again is the top. That is a very thriving, abundant colony or community of Lophelia pertusa. So those uh, video came from this region under the Gulf Stream. We had hoped to dive under the Gulf Stream farther north. This is an area called the Charleston Bump, but it was just the, the current was too strong. So we kind of got pushed to the east. We had to find a safe place to dive. And we looked in the area known as Richardson Hills. We had some good recent maps. And we had hoped to dive on one of these edges of the cliffs, hoping that maybe these were deep coral mounds, but we couldn't do any of that. It was, the current was still too strong. And we ended up finding a way to dive way over here, dive site seven and blowing that up. I was particularly interested in this because it looked like um, a, a rocky habitat, a cliff or something, we weren't sure. Um, certainly does not look like a mound. And so we wanted to go up and then across the top. Turned out it was a mound. It was just that the sides had collapsed and eroded away. And so on the top, again, was this abundant living community of Lophelia, uh, Madripora was also here. Other coral species live within this habitat as well and many different organisms are living within this framework. There's a lot of space just below the most recently dead rubble. And so again, a very thriving habitat. My colleague who was the co-lead, Cheryl Morrison, fortunately was on an expedition right after ours using the submersible Alvin. You're probably familiar with that. And they were a part of a group called Deep Search, and they are always seeking deep sea corals as well. And they were able to dive on this section of the region that we had just visited. And Cheryl was just thrilled because they found, um, as hypothesized, that all of these were individual deep sea coral mounds. And there's the Alvin. And they verified that it was over 85 miles in length. So this is a major find, a deep sea coral reef in you know, 800 meters of water, very deep, and 160 miles off the coast. And they did collect specimens to look at the diversity of the corals and to age date them, to get DNA samples. Um, they had a greater capability than we did, and they were there a lot longer than we were. So kudos to them. They did a great job. So the last site I'm going to show you is Lophelia Banks, as the name implies. It is another mound that was built by Lophelia, and this is an area that is currently protected. Because it had been explored by others uh, several times, we wanted to explore a different portion of it. This view shows this, the Gulf Stream would be coming from the upper right of this image across. So north is kind of to the left here. And we uh, started our dive at the base of this sort of ramp on the outside of Lophelia, fully expecting to find, as before, living Lophelia coral we found none. Instead, we found the coral rubble being fully inhabited by anemones, which are relatives to deep sea corals. And you can see it looked like chrysanthemums. Uh, we thought it looked like a flower garden. And many of the same species coexisted, a lot of squat, squat lobsters, other corals still, there's a cusk eel down here hiding in the rubble. An incredible, again, very diverse habitat, but Lophelia was no longer living there. 
The other thing we found of significance was the wreck fish. This guy is very meaty. You can see the laser beams are measuring him. Just that little bit is 10 centimeters. We saw several there and some were over a meter in length. Wreck fish are very tasty fish. We're wondering, do we need to protect their habitat? They're smart. They live in this area that's already protected. Some of you may have heard of the Charleston bump and followed our expeditions with George Sedbury's group at South Carolina DNR in the early 2000s, where we did submersible dives on the Charleston bump. The Charleston bump is the only known spawning habitat in the North Atlantic for these very large wreck fish. So we have been looking at protecting the Charleston bump because if you wipe out where they spawn, that would definitely impact the life cycle of these large guys. So um, lots of interest in the seafloor. Even if there isn't living Lophelia, they still provide habitat. So I'm going to stop there because we're running out of time. And um, I just want to say if you're, if I've piqued your interest, I, I trust that I have because I've never found anyone who isn't interested in this. Um, but our expedition was called Windows to the Deep, and you can go to oceanexplorer.noaa.gov and not only look at our expedition, but there are many, many expeditions that NOAA OER has conducted in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, in deep water, and even in the Western Pacific near um, the, uh, at the Mariana Trench. It's incredible what, what is on that website. I recommend the first stop would be the image and video gallery of any of these. And you can learn so much to see if it's of interest to you and then go deeper, dive deeper, um, and get into the background resources that are also on each of the expedition websites. On ours, uh, Daniel Wagner talked about the Management Council's designation. This is not from our site. He wrote this before our expedition, but it emphasizes why we are interested in protecting these diverse ecosystems. Um, NOAA also, in a three-year, really a two-year period, it got cut short because of COVID, sadly, but visited our region another time in the following year. So Windows to the Deep 2019, they found even more areas of, of incredible communities. This is a bamboo coral, two bamboo corals, almost six feet tall. You lose a sense of scale easily, but these are just massive, some of these, and another bubblegum paragorgia uh, coral. In uh, later, the latter part of 2019, they visited one more time and found what they called the Coral Highway. Here up close is a bamboo coral. You see why we call it a bamboo coral. Um, and sadly, on almost every dive, we do see influence of people. We see marine debris, usually not um, abundant, but almost every dive, we see something to show that humans have been nearby, at least in the surface waters. So those sites, those are the expeditions in 2018 and 2019 that OER conducted, but also that deep search dive um, that discovered the long reef that I mentioned earlier with the Alvin, that's also on the same website. And deep search was able to go back in 2019 and follow up. So they have done an incredible job. So I highly recommend going to all of these sites. And again, there is your, um, your link there. So I'm going to end here and uh, uh, open it up for questions and I'll hand it back over to you, Rachel. Yeah, great. Thank you, Leslie. That was excellent as always. Um, we have a, quite a number of questions, so I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, unfortunately, but I will try to consolidate a few of them. Um, and if we don't get to them, we have Leslie's contact information right there on that screen. So if you know, you're know you dying to get your answer, I'm going to go ahead and put it out there that they can ask you over email. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. It's finals week next week, so it might be a little delay, but I will get back to you. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, all right, we had a couple of questions in terms of the sonar affecting sea life, uh -huh. specifically whales, dolphins, who have been shown to be negatively affected by some types of sonar. And the other question was, does the multi-beam sonar disrupt wildlife at all? Okay, I often get that question. The type of sonar that is detrimental to marine mammals is a completely different frequency. It's used to map the subsurface, so you need much more energy, different wavelength, whatever, and it's a, that is called seismic profiling. Um, we use the very similar sonar to what dolphins use, and in fact, I've been on a cruise where we were taking, we were collecting data, and the dolphins were attracted to the vessel and played with the sonar. They were wondering who was in their neighborhood. So there is no evidence, certainly in the types of sonar that that we utilize for damaging wildlife. So fortunately, I sure wouldn't be involved if it was, nor would Noah. <laughs> right, definitely. <laughs> That's what I thought was too. <laughs> yeah. Um, that would be a little counterintuitive. I think so. So but a I, very important question to clarify. Thank you. Yes. Um, I had a few questions about kind of the marine, if there is, a means to establish marine protected areas and kind of what these mean to fight against oil drilling off of our coast. Um, do you want to speak to any of that? Sure, uh, I mean, very briefly, because that's not sure. what I specifically do. Um, and uh, the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council is very tuned in to what needs to be protected from any kind of disruption, including certainly oil and gas exploration. Um, so I'm, if you're very interested in that, I would suggest you reach out to the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council directly. And um, there are other groups that they are associated with to determine, it's a long process to get a marine protected area and there are different types of marine protected areas as well. That's a good, that's a good thing to mention. There are many different types and mm -hmm. they all have different management. Marine, marine sanctuaries, MPAs, habitat areas of particular concern. Those are all different types of protections. Right. All right. Um, let's see. Are there any future expeditions planned for this area and when they can be done again? Oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> uh, Noah was supposed to have another operation um, this year. Of course, nothing happened due to COVID. Um, we're hoping that Noah will get this year back next year and, and be able. They were supposed to go. The ship was supposed to go to the Pacific in 2021. I don't know yet if they're going to return to or stay in the Atlantic for another year. But I will say they were not planning to do any more dives on the Blake Plateau area. They were planning to go to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and do some other explorations. So right now, OER isn't planning to come back, but other groups are still doing a lot of the work um, of, with submersibles. And I'm sure Noah will be broadcasting what they do, like Deep Search, as I showed you. Definitely. And kind of along those lines, another question was just how far do these explorations kind of travel? Um, are you in international waters? And kind of how do you arrange those permits and how does that get decided upon? Um, that is the job of NOAA for before, long before they pick their uh, sites, you know, their general regions to study. Uh, we were not able to go outside the economic exclusive or exclusive economic zone. I can't remember what e, e, the e easy. <laughs> we couldn't do that. We didn't have the permits. So we stayed within our waters. Many of the expeditions do cross over into international waters or into, um, you know, open waters like the mid Atlantic Ridge doesn't require permits. But if we go into Canadian waters, then yes, they have to get the permits for that. Great, thank you. Um, we had a few questions kind of related to the water quality and water changing in terms of how does ocean acidity levels affect deep sea corals? Um, and we had one more relating to how does the salinity and temperatures change? 
at different water depths? At, at different water depths, yeah. It's, well, first of all, it's much colder on the seabed. I don't recall the actual temperatures, but it's something like 15 to 18 degrees C instead of summer temperatures at the surface are more like 25 to 27. So it's definitely colder. And um, the acidity is something that is, is in a long-term situation going to impact deep sea corals, but climate change in general, temperatures aren't going to change that much on the sea floor. Temperature variations will affect the shallow water corals much more prominently than the deep water corals. Um, the salinities are greater on the seabed, but it's not um, in the Gulf of Mexico, that, for example, there are areas of hypersaline concentrations, really, really salty. But these are not such high salt content on the seabed that you don't have sort of normal range of species and fish, uh, uh, of fish and uh, deep sea invertebrates. Right. So the climate shift, the acidity levels eventually will impact deep sea corals because acid and calcium carbonate don't mix well, or they do mix. So unfortunately, they cause dissolution. Um, and so some that, other question is just how do deep sea corals uh, develop colors and compare to the shallow water corals? Yeah, that's a good question because it isn't from algal symbionts. And I'm not the person to ask that. Um, but I would suggest you go on to the, again, the OER website and Scott France, who is a coral biologist, has a piece on there about color in the deep sea. And it's really fascinating. So I recommend you yes, go to that. I agree. I, I have learned a little bit about that in my past, about why everything is colored red in the deep sea. Yeah, that has something to do with what wavelengths mm -hmm. are the easiest for organisms to visualize it using other means. Right. Um, have you lost anything? <laughs> um, no, I don't think. You mean, <laughs> did we leave something behind? <laughs> I guess the no, no. <laughs> we didn't contribute to the marine debris. <laughs> But that was a trick question. No. <laughs> um, how does the shelf impact oncoming hurricanes? The uh, shelf? Yeah. Um, well, as hurricanes approach shore, they are, um, you've probably heard of storm surge, a low pressure system of hurricane actually causes an elevation in the sea. And when that impacts the edge of the continental mar of the of the shelf it's shallow enough so that water begins to build upward because that water has to go somewhere and if the base of that swelling water is now running into shallow water it builds up and that's why we get a massive storm surge on land with large hurricanes right um all right so besides wreck fish did you see or have you heard of any other commercially significant fish, fish species um, in these sites? In the deep sea? Um, I don't recall any other fish, but that golden crab is very commercially valuable. And so uh, one of the purposes of these expeditions is to identify its habitat and see what fishing, which requires trawling for that, um, how uh, trawling for uh, golden crab would impact other species. And as you saw, it's, right. it's, it would damage a lot and the very old coral growth as well. Yeah, very cool footage of the, that wreck fish and golden crab. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question we had, kind of thinking more broadly over, over the time that you've been studying deep sea ecosystems, have there been any notable or significant changes that you've noticed from the beginning of your exploration of the deep to now? Kind of a large question. <laughs> yeah, it is. And to be fair, to be a scientist, I'd have to go back to the same place twice. Sure. Because every place we visit is so different from the next one or from the previous one that you can't really compare apples to oranges. Um, right. So if we were to revisit the same sites 
years later, then I'd be able to tell you that. Um, I will say that one of the dives that Noah conducted that I wasn't a part of, but one of my students has investigated is to an area that was trawled for manganese nodules, which are, are nodules of manganese and iron and uh, phosphate and are potentially mineable. And in the 60s, there was an experiment to trawl for those and then to see what the habitat was with cameras. They didn't have, or I'm not even sure if they were able to take pictures of the seafloor in the 60s, but mm -hmm. Noah went back to that same site to see what the community was. And um, they didn't find any community, but it was also a very flat area that typically doesn't have it. So um, the manganese nodules were still exposed and still there, but that again isn't a real fair comparison because we didn't have good visualization of the seabed in the 60s either. But that's at least an attempt to start looking at um, the effects of potential damage. Similarly, a, a question was asked if anyone had mapped biodiversity along these dives um, and is there a pattern that you noticed of more areas more diverse and why? Yes, I mean, we're, we're doing that mentally and visually all the time. And there are many scientists who are using the data. The wonderful thing about everything NOAA OER does is it's all data available to anyone. All the samples collected go to an archive available to anyone. All the video you can download, all of the chat room discussions, all of that is available to anyone. It's very open. It's, it's remarkable, really. Um, so I have some of my undergraduate students have done just that. They have assessed just what's in the view during a dive and assessed what is present at different type, different parts of the dive and on what different habitats. That's what our interest really is. And what we definitely notice is the sandy bottom areas have very low diversity. Um, very low abundances of organisms. And as, as soon as you start getting some topography on the seabed and exposure of rock, you start seeing clusters of organisms, you start seeing the biodiversity increase and the abundances increase. And, and then as soon, when you get to the tops of features where the currents are strong, if there's something to hold on to, that's where you see the richest environments. So that's sort of generally what we see. Um, and then, of course, the mound structures are incredibly biodiverse at the tops. At the bases, here and there you find corals, here and there you find a few fish, but nothing like what you see at the top. Great. Well, that we're hitting the end of our time. Um, I will speak for everyone that has written in the chat in the question and answer boxes as a lot of people have wrote thank you and that it was very fascinating and informative. So I will pass that along and, and I can agree. So thank you so much, Leslie. We appreciate it again. If you all need to reach out to us, our emails are on the slide right here. Feel free to reach out to me or Leslie. Um, I put the websites to her expedition as well as all the expeditions in the chat box if you guys want to click that and save that website and browse around yourself. Other than that, we are one minute over. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.